Um, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Abby Kratz. I am the director of the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies at the University of Texas in Dallas. And I just. As for the center, I know. Um, I just could not be happier than to see you all here this afternoon to hear a wonderful lecture by Professor Wendy Lauer, who's come all the way from California to visit with you this afternoon. Um, my role is just to welcome you here and to introduce you to our provost, executive vice president, Dr. Austin Wildenthal, who will start our lecture. There's an extra intimidating factor in words being printed up here as people speak. <laughs> it's, it's a great privilege for me uh, representing uh, President Daniel Lee, the Scraps, the whole faculty staff, and the student body the University of Texas at Dallas to welcome all of you here to what is uh, an annual high point of the calendar of UP Dallas. Uh, for more than a couple of decades, the Oxford lectures on the Holocaust have been one of the signal events of the um, academic year at UT Dallas. Just as has the Academic Center for Holocaust Studies been a focal point of scholarship and teaching at the university. And one of the wonderful things both about the Academic Center and the Oxford lecture is that uh, it gives us a venue for inviting our friends in the community to join us at the university to share in the research and education that goes on here on the topic of the Holocaust. So it's a, it's a privilege for the university to host the Action Center and to sponsor the Ashford Lecture. Um, now we've got several other uh, key people that we're going to parade up here. And the next one is Mr. Sully Velocity, the chairman of our advisory board. Sully. Thank you all for coming today. This is one of the biggest crowds we've had. In many, many years, it's a group that you and you, uh, you were here five and a half years ago, and uh, you were wonderful. I, I reread my notes from five and a half years ago, and I commented how excited everybody was to hear you and, and uh, you the lecture. Uh, I'm chairman of the uh, advisory board, and uh, oh, what a great honor it is for us be part of the University of Texas at Dallas and to witness all the great growth and, and excitement that's happened on this campus year after year is really an extraordinary success story. But you know, all the stories of success boil down to people. It always comes to a question of leadership. And the University of Texas and Dallas has been very, very fortunate to have two great leaders over these years. One you just heard from, Austin Wildenthal, who's the provost and the chief operating officer. And the other leader of the University of Texas at Dallas is our president, David Daniel. And we're very honored to have David Daniel with us today. I'd like to ask him to please stand up and be recognized. It's such an honor to be associated with an organization uh, that stands for excellence. Uh, the culture of an organization, they say, is, is more important than strategy. And the culture here at the University of Texas at Dallas starts at the top. And uh, David Daniel says that at UPD, we expect excellence in everything we do. And that's something that we can aspire to also and all of us on the advisory board will do our best to help the leadership of the university achieve their goals and achieve the goals that they set for the uh, Ackerman Center. There are a few other people who are 
real importance to the action center that I'd like to take a couple of minutes to recognize. Uh, one is Dean Kratz, Abby Kratz's husband, Dennis Kratz, who is the Dennis is the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities, and the Ackman Center comes under his uh, leadership. Another person uh, I'd like you to know is Dr. Burton Einsberg, who started the Einsberg Lecture Series. Burton is here with us. Is uh, Mimi here? I want to see Mimi and uh, Mitch Barnett. Are they here? No? Okay, uh, Shelly, you stand up. They're on their way. Mimi's always here. Anyway, the, the Barnetts uh, is a family uh, that founded the uh, and established the Leah and Paul Lewis uh, endowed uh, chairmanship, which Judy Oshkot, uh Chair, had that chair, and uh, they started this many, many years ago, and uh, we we're always thankful for, for uh, the Barnett's for having begun with the first endowed chair at the university. Uh, I want to recognize Stan and Barbara Raven. Uh, stand up, Bob. We have a Stan and Bob uh, Barbara Rabin uh, professorship that was established here, and that uh, professorship is held by uh, Professor Niels Roma. Stan Rabin, by the way, is going to be honored later this week by the Dallas Holocaust Museum uh, with the Hope for Humanity Award, and we're very proud of him for that. And with us today is a gentleman named John Massey. Is John here? John, stand up. John, John uh, funded and started a, a, chair, a chair in Holocaust Studies for his good friend Hill Feinberg. And uh, that chair is held by David Patterson. Where is David? Bye -bye. At this university, the Ackman Center, we have three endowed chairs and professorships. So that's really extraordinary. A lot of universities have adjunct professors and they have people who come and go, but we have three full-time uh, endowed professors. So that speaks very well for the university and for the uh, Ackman Center. Um, we have two other people I want to recognize is, uh, is Sarah Valenti in the room. Sarah is a PhD candidate. There she is. Sarah, Sarah Valenti uh, holds the Wolofsky Fellowship, uh, which is a four year fellowship while she pursues her PhD degree. That fellowship was funded by Mr. Ed Ackerman and his family in my honor, which is enough how how moved I am that he would do that for me. So Sarah walks around the whole country giving talks and going to conferences, and she's a Belowski fellow, so it looks good for me. <laughs> and Mary Catherine Mueller, stand up. Mary, Mary is a, a scholarship. She's a, a scholarship awardee. Uh, you all probably remember uh, Mike Jacobs, who passed away this year. The Mike Jacobs family established the Mike Jacobs Fellowship, which is an annual uh, award, and uh, Mary Catherine is the first awardee for that. The reason I'm mentioning all these things is because one of our goals the next year is uh, to grow the program because the university is growing by leaps and bounds. And for us to keep up with the university, we have to offer more classes, attract more students. And one of the ways to attract more students is to offer scholarships and fellowships to get the best of the best students to come to UPD and partake, partake in our program. 
So these are just examples of gifts that people have made to the Agnes Center that is helping us to build one of the best Holocaust study programs in the world. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, introduce um, Jushi Ashkar in one minute, but I do want to just mention that on, on your desk, uh, on your chair, you should have a brochure. Uh, that's uh, a brochure that we created for the annual uh, Friends Campaign. This is the 2014-2015 Friends Campaign. Uh, we appreciate all the gifts and generosity that our friends have given us every year. We use these funds to help support the students and, and uh, uh, provide scholarships and services to, to students. So please consider your gift for this year. It's very much appreciated, very needed. And uh, one other thing, uh, in there is a card uh, that asks you to fill out your address and your phone number uh, and your email address because one of the things we're going to have very, very soon is a brand new website and uh, we're going to be doing a lot more communication. We want you to know what's going on here with the program. We want you to know all the wonderful programs that are coming up uh, for the rest of the year and in the spring. And if we have your information, if we know what your email address is, we can do a much better job of keeping you informed. So please do that. Uh, fill, fill this out before you leave, if you, if you will, and we appreciate it. Uh, now my uh, honor to thank uh, Professor Ashbach. Um, Yuji Ashbach is a known historian, an author, a lecturer. She's a professor of literary studies, the history of ideas, and she's the holder of the Leah and Paul Lewis Chair and director of the Holocaust Studies at UPD. Her latest book, published in June, with Professor Fred Turner is entitled Light Within Shade, 800 Years of Hungarian Poetry, 129 Poems, Love Poems, Epic Poems, and some poems dealing with anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Uh, and most of these poems have never been translated before. It's a wonderful book, and I'll, maybe you'll think about getting a copy of it. Uh, her book, The Foamy Sky, which um, is translated poems of Radnadi, the famous uh, Hungarian poet, is now in its third printing. She is a um, Holocaust survivor and an escapee from Hungary under Russian occupation. And she wrote a magnificent memoir called When the Danube Ran Red. And that book is being used in high schools all across the country now as a textbook. In addition to the teaching, uh, Professor Ashkar has lectured at the JCC for the Learning Fest. She's a lecturer at the Legacy, uh, at the Levine Academy, at the Medical School on the subject of euthanasia during the Nazi regime, and she's lectured at UN. She's a girl who can't say no. She, she does everything. She's, she's available to students at any time. And uh, people ask her to come and lecture. She's she yes. uh, She was appointed by the governor of Texas to serve on the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. And she's a lifetime member of the Dallas Holocaust Museum of Education and Tolerance. Uh, in addition, she's an accomplished musician, beloved teacher, of course, an expert cook, and she's the proud mother of two brilliant children. A son is a professor of mathematics at Princeton, and a daughter who's a, uh, a uh, physician, a, a vascular surgeon in upstate New York. Uh, and then she has five beautiful Ordinary, above average children is <laughs> great children. So uh, let's welcome Judy Asma.
thank you very much. Okay. And so it is my um, role to introduce uh, our wonderful speaker today, Dr. Wendy Lauer, who is the John K. Roth Chair of History at uh, Claremont McKenna College. Uh, she also is a research associate of the Ludwig Maximilian University in München. Um, so she has, uh, Dr. Lauer has worked here in Dallas, um, and she has been speaking about her wonderful, I think, third book, um, which is uh, um, Nazi Empire Building uh, and the Holocaust in Ukraine. But uh, this time she has written a new book, and you will be able to uh, judge it. Perhaps you haven't read it, because she will talk about it, but after that you certainly will go out and buy it, because it's one of the most interesting and most important books written uh, about the Holocaust. Thank you very much. So, so much for that lovely introduction. It's such an honor, such a pleasure to be back here in Dallas with all of you. Um, I want to thank Bert Einstein um, for sponsoring this lectureship. Uh, it's a wonderful addition to your program. I'm really struck by how much the program has grown since I was here in 2009. Just listening to the chairs and the growth of the university, it's, it's a very exciting place to be. I'm feeling that right now. So thank you very much for bringing me back. Um, I want to acknowledge um, all the efforts of those who organized this lecture and invited me, um, Abby Kratz and Bonnie Gordon, and um, also mention that I uh, unfortunately was not able to arrive yesterday. It was all my error. It was my fault. It had nothing to do with the lovely people who organized the event and communicated with me very clearly. Um, but I did something that I've never done before. I missed my flight yesterday. Um, so that was my bad, as they say. Um, and I apologize to Jeff Ross and Stephanie Schneider, who organized a lovely reception um, in conjunction with this lectureship last night that I um, unfortunately had to miss. So, um, press. Okay, so um, let's turn our attention to uh, Hitler's Furies tonight, and that um, the book that I produced that came out last year that is had been on a kind of whirlwind tour. Um, honestly, I think I may have missed that flight yesterday because I don't know where I am half the time and where I'm supposed to be going. It's been a really a wild ride. Um, I had no idea that there was interest in this aspect of Holocaust history. And I'm very encouraged. We talked a little bit with students uh, prior to my lecture. Uh, we were talking about this growth in, in and a Holocaust fatigue, the assumption that we no longer is to know when in fact we don't. And there's so much information coming out now. We have more archival documentation at our fingertips than ever before. And I just think that a book like the series is a demonstration of just how much more we need to research and teach and learn about the Holocaust. Now, I don't have um, enough time tonight to go into all the aspects of this book and the themes and the case studies. And if I did, it would just overwhelm and exhaust you. So I thought it might, might make sense for me to talk about how this book came to be, like a little bit of the backstory of the origins of the book, and then highlight a couple of the case studies that I think are really representative of, of the research and, and what you're going to find in the book. My research interest in German women did not, um, wasn't what I was looking for in 1992 when I first went to the archives in Ukraine. Some of you were at my talk in 2009 on Nazi Empire Building the Holocaust, and you might remember the town that I worked on, Zhitomir, Ukraine, which is about 100 miles west of Kiev. And it was in the summer of 1992 when I went to the archives in Zhitomir, um, working on my dissertation, that and the Soviet Union had collapsed, um, Ukraine was a new country, the archives were opening up, it was very exciting to be a graduate student at that moment in time in this field, 
and most um, scholars were working on a, a very particular question at that time. It had to do with decision making, it had to do with the origins of the final solution. When was it that Hitler and Hitler and his um, cronies, you know, at what point did they decide to move in the direction of mass murder of, of not only German Jews, but all European Jews and new plants beyond Europe, global Jewry? So um, this was the question, and I thought very kind of naively um, that maybe if I went to the archives in Ukraine and went to the town where Himmler had his headquarters, Shatomer, I was to steal the headquarters in Ukraine, I might be able to find that document, you know, the smoking gun document, the Hitler order, the decision-making document, um, and wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be grand? I would have a nice, successful career after that, perhaps. Um, well, what I found was not uh, the Hitler order or the Hitler order. Uh, what I found were a lot of local, regional level um, uh, policy kind of documents, police records, interrogations, um, economic reports for the development of the region, and as for exploiting it as a kind of imperial um, column, imperial entity that occupied it, but they had a lot, a lot much larger plans um, for transforming the region. And I found amongst these records a file that showed me that German women, young German women, were also in Chitalmer. And they were staying at a German-only kind of women's dorm. The Germans, the leadership wanted to keep the German women separate from the rest of the population. Um, and I was really surprised by that find because I assumed that German women, ordinary German women, were back in the right, were staying in Germany, back in the home front, defending the home front, and her men were being sent to go to battle in the Eastern Territories, in the Eastern Front, um, and that they should be in these zones. They should be in these war zones, and they should be in these zones behind the lines which became the Nazi killing fields, which became these zone zones of the mass murder, the Holocaust, and the anti-partisan warfare. This document here on the screen is, is from Riga, um, but it's similar to the kind of um, list that I'm referring to. You can see, uh, if you read the German, I can just point out Fräulein, um, you know, these women are kind of listed in the document uh, here in the, in the front room. Uh, telephone operators, Fräulein Haza, Fräulein um, Herr Fichner, Gernold. I mean, just this, this kind of a list. Um, you know, just curious list, wasn't really sure if anything was. Any stories could be told from that list, just a basic document. I went back to the Western Archives um, and I looked at some of the war crimes investigation and starting to realize, now starting to see that, that there are women in places like Ukraine and places um, like in, in Riga and Latvia. And then I went back to the records that scholars have been using for decades and realized that thousands of women were being called to testify as witnesses. And many were very forthcoming since prosecutors were more interested in the heinous crimes of their bosses um, or their husbands. And we hadn't really questioned why these women were able to give these detailed accounts. We had been pulling that information out to write the history of the Holocaust, but not really uh, questioning why they knew so much. Plus, many of the women described what they saw and experienced in a very callous, kind of cavalier tone. One former kindergarten teacher in Ukraine begrudged that Jewish thing during the war. She and her female colleagues had been briefed as they crossed the border from Germany into Eastern occupied zones in 1942, and she remembered that a Nazi official in a gold brownish uniform had reassured them that they should not be afraid when they hear gunfire. It was just that a few Jews were being shot. Then we became curious about what was in the published literature. What had been written thus far on the topic of women in the Holocaust were women in Nazi Germany. I knew about some of the depictions you may be familiar with of female Nazis, camp guards, like Herman Reza, the beautiful Pista Delson, or Herman, Herman Braunsteiner, the guard from Maidana. But these were portraits of women and of female Nazis that were really uh, gross distortions. What one historian, Claudia Pence, observed sensationalized Nazism by locating evil in eroticized women. So these were sexualized and pornographic depictions of female perpetrators. And I went back to the literature and I basically determined that there were these really uh, polar extremes in terms of representations of women. Either women were 
emotionally fanatical um, and cheerleaders for the cure and really just driven by their emotional or uh, sexual impulses. Or, on the other hand, they were purely victims of the regime, and the regime was valuing them as baby machines for the cure. Where did women fit into the history of Holocaust literature? Which was moving into many different directions that I know many of you are aware of, um, including the uh, massacre outside the camp system, so words by people like Timothy Snyder on the bloodlines. Where do women figure into this growing um, understanding of how the Holocaust happened and how men perpetrated the Holocaust? We have, for instance, going back decades, Hannah Arendt's study of life and its finality. Um, it's the thoughtless bureaucrat. We have Rolf Hulbert's machinery of destruction. Um, Christopher Browning's work on ordinary men. And all these different typologies of, of the ambitious careerist, the efficient desk murderer, the ideological Jew leader, the voracious plunderer, the, the technocrat, the Nazi doctors, the unfettered sadist. Uh, so the realm of, of, of analysis of male portrayal had grown into all these nuanced portraits. Um, but we didn't have anything like that in the realm of kind of studying female perpetrators, and we certainly didn't have much in the way of looking at how men and women worked together in carrying out genocide. Did it make sense to study evil and cruelty as a gender phenomenon? If we presume a female nature of innocence, do we end up removing women from the history of genocide and losing sight of genocide as a human problem of behavior that applies to men as well as women? Look at even the literature, the photographic evidence. Um, it's just another example here of the kind of blind spot um, that was that was out there. Here's a this is a pretty uh, many of you some students are working on perpetrators in the testimony of this book. So it's a group photograph. Um, these are the uh, this is the staff at Treblinka um, up here. Um, all these tanks to cook. An unknown woman, says her, that's her passion. Classic, classic. So this drove me crazy, right? I wanted to know, what is she doing there, and who is she, and what's her, what's her story, and did she get involved in the operations at, at Triplinko or elsewhere in the East? The story Ann Taylor Allen, I think, also sums this up pretty nicely. She states, women, while they remain in the female sphere, are thus endowed with innocence of the times of the modern state. But at the price of being placed outside of modernity and indeed outside of history itself. So, as long as we uh, think about the role of women in all the different ways that we've thought about the role, roles of men, uh, and we don't include them in the story of the Holocaust, which is the perpetration of the Holocaust, we're, we're leaving out the story of how genocide happens, we're leaving out the story of modern history leaving women out of the story of history itself. I started to see a blind spot which over time became a glaring omission, and it became clear to me that the list of teachers and other female non sephardic activists that I had found in 1992 in Ukraine was in different place Hundreds of thousands of German women went east, and they were indeed integral parts of the Nazi machine of destruction. I was able to put ordinary German women on the map of Nazi-occupied Europe. The German Red Cross uh, trained about 640,000 women and 400,000 of them were in occupied zones. The German Army trained a half a million women in support positions. In the West and police offices, 30,000 women. Tens of thousands of women were in the regional offices of Eastern Europe working uh, for these imperial governors. Um, and teachers, they were spread out across parts of Poland, in particular, working as kindergarten teachers. Um, of course, there were the spouses of the SS men who ended up being among the worst of the perpetrators. By the Nazi East, I'm talking about this area that's gray here, extending as far as Stalingrad. Uh, most of my work focuses on Ukraine um, and the Belarus and the Baltics. Particularly Ukraine, which is historically important in Jewish history, it's very uh, the former pale settlement, Russian Tsar's pale settlement. The files started to grow and stories started to take shape. There were indeed many shocking moments uh, working in the field and in the witnesses, my suspected mass murder or as accomplices to mass murder. 
One of the outstanding cases in her series is that of Erna Patriot. In summer 2005, I was in the archive of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, sitting in a microfilm reader, and new files had been digitized and made available to researchers. Cross. These are the records of the East German secret police. And in fact, when I was here in 2009, I was just starting to and some of you might remember in the history was part of that uh, presentation. And this interrogation is from uh, 1961, August 1961. And you can see up here, it uh, begins uh, starting at 8, 8 a.m. and it ends at 9.45. It's a long interrogation because there's one break. And it starts with her confession. As to shooting six children. As I read the report, the full report all the details, I had the luxury, in a way, of pulling back from the microphone reader and looking around the reading room. I had the luxury of trying to make sense of this and to research it many decades and miles removed from the events. But this is all the more reason not to turn the page and move on to the next file. I knew that the story had to come out. But I first had to track down more information to corroborate its contents. Someone like Erna was the worst, but her crimes are not the full story, and the intent of my book was not to shock readers into a numb state of disbelief or to repulse, but to explain, understand, not condone how someone like Erna and many more like her did what they did, and to reconstruct the historical era to define the actual settings and experiences that shaped these young women's convictions and actions. As the German patriots sent to the East to carry out the revolution, including his colonial genocide projects, Erna was ordinary, representative of a lost generation of German women, who I call the post-World War I baby boomers. I realized in looking at those seemingly innocuous lists that a lot of the birth dates lined up, that most of them were born right after the First World War in 1920 and 1921, so they came of age in the 30s. Suddenly I thought, oh, I've actually got a generational story here, and that adds another uh, interesting component uh, to this history, because the interwar era gave rise to more extreme forms of conservative German female activism, not feminism. First World War I baby boomers experienced childhood in the tumult and insecurity of incessant electioneering, runaway inflation, and all the bewildering and exciting process of modernity. In Hitler's fascist dictatorship, it matured to a founding generation of female idealists, careerists, and revolutionaries of the Third Reich, who aligned themselves with a bolder experiment, even in Weimar. They did so with much greater engagement than their forefathers, and the consequences of their politicization and mass mobilization were much more devastating. Now, you may be familiar with the propaganda of the, of the regime, which I referred to earlier, including the Nazi Party rally in 1934. Hitler was um, declaring in typical martial rhetoric, what man offers in heroism on the field of battle within equals with unending perseverance and sacrifice. Every child she brings into the world is a battle. And it refers to women as his fellow combatants, as these kind of baby machines. Why must be wary of taking Nazi propaganda and the declarations of Nazi leaders as fact? Propaganda is a form of kind of wish fulfillment, right, and indoctrination. Because the reality is that after 1935, the birth rate declined and the divorce rate increased. Statistics show that most German women were not married, were not constantly pregnant, and not staying at home. German women who felt empowered by movement did not see themselves as feminists who wished to challenge the patriarchy, but as agents of a conservative racist revolution. As full-fledged Aryan members of Hitler's fascist society, they were political despite themselves. In fact, the women question was not shelved, but refashioned in the Nazi era. The private became political. The tentacles of the movement reached the home and pulled women and girls out to the streets and public rallies and parades to lay those signs on farms, gatherings in summer camps, marching exercises, domestic science courses, medical examinations, fly raising, Ceremonies. Here is an image from the uh, in Berlin, the swearing in of the nurses. 
Um, and over here is a recruiting poster. It says, the East needs you, up. Um, and it's directed to German women and German girls. And it's encouraging them to go to service as welfare workers, so-called resettlement advisors, um, in Poland. I was really struck by, um, in my interviews with, with German women, book, reading of the memoirs, um, how often certain phrases came up. For instance, um, just the comment, well, I, I really wanted to make something of myself. I wanted to become somebody, which really sounds like a cliche to us. Um, but I thought about it, and I realized that that was a pretty revolutionary for a German woman, you know, in the 1920s, 1930s, they just got the vote, um, and this state system was just developing. You know, it's so all these paths, this career paths for them. Female ones, you know, clerical, nursing, teaching, um, were really opening up to them. It, it afforded them so many opportunities to get out of their villages um, <coughs> and get a paycheck, have to earn their first paycheck, for instance. So we tell our, our, our young uh, student, you know, our students and our children, go out there, self-actualize, make something of yourself, become somebody. And that's normal, that's usually a good thing, because they hope they do good things with that. Um, that's self empowerment But in this case, that, in that same kind of um, uh, motivation, that same self-awareness um, was joined to this very perfect regime, this genocidal regime. They kind of found themselves in this regime. The outbreak of the war in 1939, um, the demand for labor increased, and it, it demanded that single girls between the ages of 17 and 25 years old who were not in paid employment, not in full-time education, or undergoing vocational training, uh, they all had to be part of the war effort. So this is another reason why the story is a generational one. There was compulsory labor for not women 17 to 25. So these are young, very malleable women who then find themselves um, in significant numbers in the Eastern territories. Most of them had not been outside their hometowns. At this point in my research and plans for a book, I thought about how best to tell the story of these young women who went east. How can a generational history of this magnitude be written in a manner that does not reduce the variation of individual experiences into a one-dimensional caricature? If I took a collective biography approach, which persons could I include? How would they be chosen? Certainly the availability of source material was decisive. <laughs> Biographies would allow me to explain the origins of their behavior, their wartime experiences, and their post-war attempts to make sense, sense of what they witnessed and did. I realized that the biographical approach intertwined as a generational cohort could represent German history in the 20th century at least from the First World War I era to the present, and through the eyes of German women. The Nazi era would be properly contextualized. Biography also had the added benefit of showing how human beings change, and these women changed a lot. They were very adept at slipping in and out of roles over time. Here you can see Hitler greeting German nurses in Verdicia in August 41. Again, just the image is putting German women on the map, in this case in Ukraine, and this is right about the time that SS police forces um, were preparing for the uh, mass annihilation of the uh, Jewish community in Verdicia. Okay, why is it at the end of August? Carrying through the executions of such 12 to 15,000 Jews in mid September. Um, here's another image of Karen Petrie. I really um, was struck by this image. Uh, and I put this up there to, to illustrate what I think is a kind of hybrid form of the Nazi, of the Nazi new woman. Now, some of you may be familiar with some of the images from the Weimar period of the new woman, the post suffragette woman, the liberated woman. She's sitting with a bob to that haircut, right? Smoking a cigarette, maybe usually on a bicycle, in an urban setting, in a metropolitan setting, and a straddling bicycle. And here we get um, Walter, who becomes one of the worst perpetrators in the book, Erna, 
in the 1930s, Stratton the motorcycle, and the motorcycle was really important for the Nazi movement. The blitzkrieg kind of mentality and, and the attachment to speed and forward-looking and modernity. Uh, so the Nazi movement had their own motorcycle club, um, of which her husband was a member. Uh, and here's Ernest sitting on her husband's motorcycle. She's got her feet on the pedal. She's holding the handlebar. She's got her hair pulled back in a bonnet. And she's wearing it. That, that, that neighbor, right? So she's still a kind of house file, um, but she's got these two elements of, I think, the Nazi ideal, um, as well as inheriting what came out of the Weimar period, um, and the exciting prospects, moder modernity, the new woman. The biographies of women and in Hitler's series, I believe, represent the spectrum of young women. But I want to stress that the German women who were active in the East Responded to and contributed to the violence and specifically to the Holocaust in a number of ways. I have chosen a few examples tonight to illustrate how one woman expressed her revulsion and tried to persuade male colleagues not to participate, while other women exploited her power and even chose to kill. After presenting these few examples, I would like to devote some time suggesting possible explanations for the violence perpetrated by ordinary German women. First example is Nana Schicke Hohmeyer. I just learned this evening um, there's a connection between her and Professor Ossipus. It's really quite remarkable. I wish you can talk about that later tonight. I had the pleasure of meeting Anetta in March 2010. She shared her story with me, her personal letters uh, that she sent back to her family during the war, and these photographs, these are from her private photo album. Born in 1920, and she's, she's still alive. I came from a family, hailed from a family of German literary figures, sent back to the Revolution of 1848. She completed her law degree at the University of Munster in the 1930s, and trained law with certain idealism. She had witnessed and heard about the tortures and crimes in the 1930s, including the persecution of her own father, who was a member of the Social Democratic Party. But she soon realized that she was helpless to change the system. She described herself as timid, a young woman in 1941. She did have a sense of adventure and preferred an assignment in the open spaces of the East over a mundane desk or factory job to fill her labor duty. Summer of 41, she volunteered for the German Red Cross. She was asked to help establish new soldiers' homes. This is the image here on the left, uh, Soldatna, in Ukraine. These were places where the soldiers who were going to and from the front could stop and get enjoy German cooking, interact with German women, socialize with German women, and enjoy cultural activities. There were about 1,500 Anettas, about 300 soldiers in the East, so 1,500 women who were like Aneta placed in this assignment. She was sent to the remote town of Novgorod, Valensk, about 100 miles west of Kiev, and she worked there from October 41 until September 42. I asked her in March 2010, if she had briefed about Nazi policy police before she left. She said she didn't need to be told about why they were at war. There was enough propaganda and plenty of anti-Semitism. She remembered a casual exchange with a journalist from Berlin on the eve of her departure, who worked for a daily paper, and he warned her, and that a rush is no place for you, they are killing all the Jews there. And on, by traveling by, while traveling by train to a new position, Two soldiers, or SS men, she couldn't remember, they were in uniform, but she didn't know which kind, which uh, organization. These two men entered her compartment after the train had stopped for us to talk, and they struck up a conversation with her and her female colleague, Lily. All of a sudden, one of them told us, he had been ordered to shoot a Jewish woman. We were horrified, the man said, but it didn't say anything. She would learn more in the coming months from other German soldiers and SS men. He explained to me when I asked her, well, why were these men telling you these stories, even boasting about their gruesome deeds? Well, she said, oftentimes conversations with soldiers got personal fast. They were all men who had been around women for a long time. They had the intense need to talk. On another occasion, I was riding in a truck when all of a sudden the driver started telling me that in a village nearby, they had allowed several hundred Jews to go hungry for two days before shooting them to death because the firing squads had been busy working somewhere else. When she got to her post in, in Ukraine, a town with about 6,000 Jews, she was told that all of them had been killed. 
German officer who greeted her stated this matter of factly as they were all dining. When she was given a tour of the town, uh, a member of the engineering staff pointed out the spot on the riverbank where the Jewish men, women, and children were killed and buried. Chicken Holmeyer was one of two women running the Salat Khan and was extremely busy and kept to her work. Surrounded by thousands of soldiers, she carefully avoided the rough us in the crowd. SS men and other notorious occupation officials who brandished their whips and pistols. Only after a few weeks in Ukraine, seeing the evidence of the mass murder and the deteriorating condition of the few Jewish laborers who remained, and then wrote home to her mother, quote, what Papa says is true. People with no moral inhibitions exude a strange odor. I can now pick out these people, and many of them really do smell like blood. Oh, what an enormous slaughterhouse the world is. I made another decision in organizing and writing this book. I introduced the women in the first chapter without giving away too much about their wartime reactions. Because, after all, these young women, even the most fanatical, could not have imagined what they would see in Eastern territories. They underwent their own transformations when they went east, where their biological commitment and character were severely tested. Another one I would like to introduce you to is Lisa Lettemeyer. She is an example um, of, I would call, in, in the perpetrator literature, a kind of female death murder, so kind of female bureaucrat gets involved in the implementation of the Holocaust more officially. She's not in this picture, actually. Her boss is in this picture, Commissar Hanbe, who was in charge of the region of Lida in Belarus. I was very important in the history of the Holocaust because Jews who fled, Jews who were able to flee from Vilnius, fled to Liga, where Commissar Hanbe set up all these workshops. So an entire community of Jewish craftsmen were able to avoid the mass shootings for a time in these workshops. And those workshops also became a kind of um, uh, way station, as it were, that they, to the forest. Many, many of you may have seen the movie Defiance or heard about the Bilski Partisans. They, the Bilski Partisans came through those workshops. They went into those forests near Lida. The secretary to Commissar Ange is this one here, Ms. Lotomaya. Ms. Lotomaya was also born in 1920. She was born, she was she grew up near Leipzig. She decided to take, she has a training as an accountant, and decided to take on this position in the leader office because um, she didn't want to work at the automobile factory in Leipzig. And it was during her, tra her training and orientation for this assignment that she met Commissar Hanbe um, and they fell in love. Hanbe's kids, they are still alive. They were in the picture I showed you before. Um, they referred to her as Vice Mama. And Hanbe's wife, wife of the commissar, called her Brutus. Uh, incidentally, Hanbe and his wife divorced at the end of the war, uh, towards the end of the war. In fact, several post war statements about crimes committed by the commissar's office in Lita stressed that Meyer, his will to Meyer, the executive secretary for the commissar, was the most knowledgeable, better informed than many of the officials in the station. Survivor testimony vividly describes this local community of administrators and their families who abused the Jews in formal office settings as well as more spontaneously during recreational outings. There's one testimony that's really uh, quite, quite memorable, quite um, shocking actually. Uh, Jews who survived in Lita, who ultimately um, were part of the investigation of these officials and went back to the courtroom and identified these low to honor and her, and her colleagues. Um, and on one particular Sunday, all the Jews of Lido were called to go to the nearby forest to clear out rabbits hiding in the bushes and chase them in the direction of a German hunting party of men and women. A group of several hundred men were recruited for this job, and the Jews were marched down the road to the forest in the deep snow, shaking from cold and fear of what they would encounter. Suddenly, a group of winter carriages appeared including the local Commissar Hanbe and his staff and women wearing beautiful fur coats. They were all drunk, lying around their seats in the carriage, hugging and shouting, their peals of laughter echoing in the distance. 
the wild Germans mocked the Jews, laughed at them, and struck those nearby with whips. They aimed their rifles and started shooting at the Jews to the raucous pleasure of staff. The bullets struck some archers, who moved slowly in the snow, and then collapsed in pools of blood. When questioned about this, Secretary Meyer stated that she and her colleagues did in fact fly hunting trips, usually on Sundays. The 20 year old Meyer made sure that special orders were completed on time for the workshops. A special department hand led, led leftovers received from the boot factories and made items for her and her colleagues wallets, purses, striped colored and different boxes. And the commissar, in order to impress his lover, was commissioning. Uh, jewelry and, and um, furs, as I mentioned, to charm the officials at the commissary's office. The result of Meyer had special access to the office safe where the secret orders were stored. She had security clearance. She paid simple dictation from the commissar. She transmitted orders on behalf of her boss. She issued one authorizing the shooting of 16 Jews who appeared late for work. As she stated after the war, there was little written traffic about Jewish actions that was absolutely set, uh, secret. She had the office stamp. She could issue the gold cards, the paper ID cards. Those were life-saving documents. Some photos also from the uh, the very um, where I was happy to uncover these in an art regional archive in Germany. Uh, just to illustrate the scene here that, that Ms. Otemeyer is in the center of. Um, German female administrators were involved in these selections. These are Jews actually from Vilnius who were being marched through Lida uh, before being um, incarcerated and killed. Um, and here you have a female official here. In, in, here in, in Sloan, for instance, the secretary to the commissar pulled a Jewish woman out of the lineup like this because the woman had not finished knitting a sweater for her. Um, here we had a Jewish man, a youth, um, who had committed a minor crime and he worked in the stables. Uh, he stole bread or something, it wasn't clear. Um, he was chased into this spot here and then uh, drawn out. Someone is taking the picture, I guess, from this end. Um, that's Commissar Hande with his rifle. I, this is an unknown German woman. I do not know who this is. I want to find out. Um, and they're, they're meeting somewhat in the, in the, it's not his wife. I've checked the photos. I just don't know. Um, and he's being let out and then it's going to be, it's going to be, it's a public spectacle that, um, Commissar Hande's child, uh, recalled very vividly. What about the German women who were not working in the Nazi administration? They arrived at the East with their husbands and lovers. Officially, they had no business in the ghettos and were not supposed to get mixed up in Nazi policies, which was supposed to be man's work. Well, it turns out that the wise ministers of SS men, who were these battalion commanders, were, besides the nurses in the Nazi euthanasia program, among the worst female you know, perpetrators. People like Hazel is on the cover of the book. Locked, a former Viking secretary who was then sent to Ukraine to the Holdish and her infantry, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. These are the SS files, marriage applications. Uh, so, Liesl Wilhouse, who's on the cover, you can see Himmler had to approve all the marriages because he's trying to do racial uh, nobility. Um, and the women were subjected to logical exams and, you know, bodies were measured and fertility tested. That. And so you, this is why these marriage applications have these, um, you know, front shot profile and then full body photos. That's why we have these photos. This is the white border police commander um, 101, and this is a striking image because here she is with the men, with the rest of the group. On this particular day, the Pullman, many years is Pullman, August 1942. Um, Thousands of Jews were deported to Treblinka, and about over 900 were killed on the streets of the town. And Vera was seen uh, in, in the middle of the action, uh, taunting Jews and uh, taking photos and running around. And allegedly, she appeared to be pregnant at the time, which became part of the part of the story. And she is with her husband and her enjoying the freshness. Okay.
Verna Petrie stood trial with her husband. I only showed the interrogation of Verna, uh, but she actually stood trial with her husband, Horst, in 1960. And it's very unusual that a husband and wife stood trial together, and they stood trial for many crimes related to the Holocaust outside of the camp system, on her estate. And this is an image here of her actual manor um, house in Western Ukraine and Poland. And then I went back. Uh, 2010, as colleagues, to see in fact, you know, if this place still existed and what was going on there. And with the court record, I wanted to actually um, trace the steps of, um, of uh, and, and try to find the, the, the mass, mass grave of the Jewish children and others who were forced and Erna killed on their estate. A couple of words about Erna's remarkable passion to tell you what happened. Uh, I showed you the document before, and I'm going to read a little bit from it. The interrogator asked Myrna, where did these six children come from when you shot? And she replied, I do not know exactly where they came from, but I assume it were children who broke out of the bus car at the train station in Sashiko. At this time, all remaining Jews who were in several camps were being transported to the extermination camp of Sobibor. The railway line that went from Lviv to Belgium to Sobibor went parallel their property. So in 1943, Jews who were trying to get uh, escape those deportations would break out of the box cars and then look for refuge on this estate. And that's how Erna got involved, and that's how, why she face to face with these Jewish um, uh, fugitives, that we call them. Um, and ultimately why she did what she did. And so these children were seeking actually a hiding place. They, they probably thought, you know, as a woman, that she was not going to be threatening. She brought them back to the house. She comforted them. Uh, allegedly, she even fed them, waited for her husband. He didn't appear. She went up to her bedroom and got a gun that was given to her by her father from the First World War, came down, um, and then marched with them, brought them to this um, actual site was established on her plantation and shot them um, back then. She explained her motive to the interrogator uh, as anti Semitism, that she had been indoctrinated during the Nazi era and um, even explained that this was something that was commonly done, that, this, that she had learned from the other SS men who visited the estate how to carry out the killing. I knew that she could do it with impunity. The explanations for this kind of violence, uh, genocidal violence, are varied, and many disciplines have become involved you know, uh, in this, including primatologists and, of course, psychologists. I ended up agreeing with social psychologist James Waller uh, that all men and women have the potential to commit evil acts. But it is our environment and social conditioning that brings out this capability. It is a minority who go to the extreme of killing. I also took very seriously the observations of one of the prosecutors I spoke to, including uh, the gentleman who, the state prosecutor in Germany, who interviewed the women in my book, some of the killers. He said that he did not encounter anyone who could be described as psychopathic. In his words, the individuals were not the same. It was the Nazi system that was crazy. These individuals, he said, were no longer a threat to society. They were normal law-abiding citizens in the new democratic Germany. Ostensibly, they were successful chameleons. After reading thousands of pages of wartime documents, court records, and testimonies, I decided to visit the wartime crime scene pictured here. The archival record of Ernie Petrie's trial contains sketches and photographs of the plantation in western Ukraine. I was not sure what I would find there. I did not know if the place actually existed or what I would do once I got there. I found a location on a local map. It was a short taxi trip from Lviv heading north. We drove parallel with the same railway lines that had taken hundreds of thousands of Polish and Ukrainian Jews to the gas facilities to Belgium to Sobibor. We turned down the same road that Vernon Petrie took that fateful day when she spotted Jewish boys who had fled from the bus car. We ended the long driveway leading to the manor, which had changed from a stately home to a decrepit structure overgrown with weeds. The porch was two pillars with a sagging middle, precariously standing on cinder blocks. Even when I knew the place felt haunted, 
but to the poor elderly Ukrainians to reach out in assistance there, it was home. Filled with ironwork on the terrace where Petri had served cake and coffee was rusted and flaking, like brittle bones crumbling at the joints. Laundry was hung there to dry. Women living there immediately appeared when they saw us, strangers in city clothes with cameras stepping out of the taxi. We walked a few hundred meters in the direction of the location that's described in the court record as the murder site. It was a strip of forest along a gully that divided two fields. I was momentarily distracted by the scene around me, which was picturesque and peaceful. Fields were being harvested by farmers with horse drawn plows in my hand. The crisp, colorful September sunset illuminated the rolling hills and flashed off several of the cranes in the leaders of the church steeples. Every acre was being cultivated except for two weedy spots an overgrown graveyard and the forest gully. The graveyard was an impenetrable mass of growing bushes. One could descend into the gully, but the prospect was not fighting. Passers by threw their garbage there, plastic bags, rags, and booze bottles. Or perhaps the rain had carried the waste into this crevice. This is not the only site in Ukraine where mass graves from the Holocaust, the bones and all the personal possessions of Jewish victims, lie a few meters below the surface, covered with weeds and empty bottles and other refuse. I stood there meditating, praying, and thinking about what happened there, and what those frightened Jewish children who whimpered when her Petri drew her pistol might have achieved that they lived. Apparently, I stood there too long. A Ukrainian peasant with his wool cap, flannel shirt, threadbare jacket, and then the pants, pants, accosted me. It was time for me to go. In many ways, the first series is about how we feel directly with the past, not so much as an historical reconstruction or morality tale, but as evidence of a recurring problem in which we all share responsibility. What are the blind spots and taboos that persist in our retelling of events, in memoirs, and in our national histories? Why does this history continue to haunt us, generations, and many miles removed in places like Western Ukraine? The census in Holocaust and genocide studies is that the systems that made mass murder possible would not function without the broad participation of society. And nearly all the histories of the Holocaust leave out half of those who populated that society, as if when this history happens somewhere else. It is an illogical approach and a puzzling omission. Mad stories of the Hitler's theories reveal the darkest side of female activism. They show us what can happen when women are mobilized for the war and acquiesce in genocide. Thank you very much. Dr. Lauer has agreed to, uh, uh, to take questions from the audience, so uh, prepare your questions while she closes down here. And uh, let's get started. I've read your book several times. It's excellent. I have so many questions in there. Imagination. Uh, question I have is what's been your feedback with various citizen groups <laughs> in the Okay, so I'll repeat the question. Um, I'm sorry about is the audio has it been okay or is it Um, I was trying to keep. It's okay. All right. Um, it's interesting you ask about the German reaction. We were talking about that earlier today with the students. Um, when the book came out in England, the UK edition, the book has come out in 19 languages. Foreign rights person at Hope Mifflin has been just dogged and determined about getting it out in every European country. Um, in any case, so I've gotten reactions from a lot of different countries, but often people ask me about the German reaction. When I was in London last year, they said, what are the Germans going to say? What are the Germans going to say? Well, the German edition came out at the end of September, and I went to, to, to Germany to do this book thing. Um, these are my initial impressions. Uh, it's not getting the attention that it's getting in other countries. Um, 
older generations understand their responsibility to, to continue to teach and use this history. And they are organizing programs and been kind of, you know, supportive. Um, and it came out with a really good press. It's gotten good academic reviews, um, but it's not like we've experienced in the past, say in the 90s, um, this, this, you know, sparking a big discussion or any kind of controversy. And um, I think that my initial, my impression is that Germany, that um, many people are tired of hearing about this history um, or fed up with it, um, at least a younger generation. So there hasn't really been any kind of a response that I, that I can read at this point. Jack Rep. I'm a Holocaust survivor. And I think the testimony I'm about to give you now has something to do with my keyboard discovery. But I just had a telephone call on the BBC a month ago. And they asked for something, you know, what was happening during the time while I was incarcerated? Where the women treated better than the men. There was no such a thing as treatment better or worse. All of it treated the same way. We had this stone to this women. And during the, during the whole time, before I got into the camp, I lived through a lot of them things I can down here. Dead barn. Transit. Killing. I cannot use men, women, and children. I was incarcerated for six years. I was liberated in that After the liberation in 1945, I weighed 69 pounds. Stayed in the hospital for four months. After four months, I was invited by the Secret Service. I would go work for. The papers to come to America in 1946, right after the war was over. I didn't come here. I worked for four years. My work was exactly like a short time here. After that, I was a deputy tribunal in Germany. I was a witness to that tribunal. I was at a lot of hangings. But you see, at the time, at the tribunal, they had the most highest price, legal advice money can buy. If you take a person like me, at that time I was incarcerated when I was 15, and I came out, I was 21. I weighed 69 pounds, and we got liberated, all of us, at Pipes. They tried to make us feel crazy at that time. How can you remember it? <coughs> What you have seen through the war. Well, I think I have seen. Not only have I seen, but if I have seen you, I remember that present that you have committed. You know what? The fall, the hanging, I think that the road. And I ask my question <coughs> how could you be out day and night committing that present that you have committed? Then go home and touch your wife or touch your kid or say a lot. You know what the answer was? I'm afraid of the fury. Choose my life. He would kill his wife. <clears throat> now, so I think in the fact that road in the hangman, because my parents had great memories as the hangman. Thank you very much. So, um, can I be heard? Um, so I wonder if, if you could speak to us about Ermine Braunsteiner. Um, I don't remember if she was living on Long Island or, or she was in the middle of the country. Uh, I think a number of these women, I don't know how many, um, I th came to this country. Some of them were brought by American soldiers, if I remember correctly, who married them, brought them to this country. Can you talk to us a little bit about 
women who managed to get to America, <clears throat> again, many of them brought here by their American soldier husbands, who made lives for themselves in America, um, how were they tracked down? What, what kind of lives do they have? Um, what percentage of them were we successful in deporting? Uh, if you can just comment a little bit on that. Yeah, the, the Braunsteiner story is really interesting because it's part of the early history of the Office of the Special Investigations, which was established in the 1970s. Um, and, you know, Simon Wiesenthal was, was on her trail. Um, she was at Majdanek, the Camp Majdanek, guard there, and was notorious for stomping. That's why they called her the mayor of Majdanek. Um, she would use her boots and stomp on the prisoners. She would use her boots and stomp on the prisoners. Um, it was also an interesting example of the types of violence that women committed in the camps. Um, they were known for using their dogs um, quite a bit. I mean, so not so much hands-on violence, but um, using their feet or using their dog or screaming, a lot of loud screaming. These are just what I've heard from survivor accounts of from the guards. Um, and of course, um, women who were involved in Robinsburg, for instance, in the medical experiments, like assisting with these medical experiments. So within the, the guard kind of complex of female perpetration, you have a lot of other different types of activities and, and roles. It was always hard to track down the challenge of, of prosecuting these women um, accomplices and killers was that they did take on maiden names. They got married. They were hard to find after the war. Um, and certainly more difficult when they got out of Germany into the United States and attached themselves to American servicemen. Um, now, um, Braunsteiner came from Austria. She had been picked up. That's why Simon Wiesenthal in Vienna was on the, her trail. She had been picked up by the, by the Viennese right after the war. She had such a reputation. Survivors had come forward. Um, but they, the Viennese, uh, the People's Court, just gave her a little slap on the wrist and said, go home, Gnädige Frau. Go home, you nice, you nice woman. And then she managed to um, you know, hang out in Austria for a time and then make it to the United States. She was brought back by a Dusseldorf court um, and convicted in this other trial that took place you know, decades, decades later. But it was quite a um, revelation in the US press when this housewife from Queens was identified and deported. She was among the first. So in the history of the Office of Special Investigations, um, you know, she ranks right up there with Demyanyuk in terms of outstanding cases. Do you have any idea how many of these women? Oh, um, how many came in here? No, no, I couldn't even I couldn't even guess a figure. I mean, it was 3,500 guards. That's one document we have that lists guards. There's probably a lot more. We used to think that there were a few hundred concentration camps. Now we know there were like 40,000 Nazi internment sites. And when you have an increase in internment sites into the tens of thousands, you're going to have an increase in, fam in, in guards. Himmler wanted female guards to oversee female prisoners. So the story of female guards has yet another book to be written. We haven't scratched the surface on that. And then to try to figure out how many came to the US, um, you know, I, it's, yeah, it's, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't give you a figure. Uh, my mother-in-law actually knew uh, Braunsteiner from my Danuk, but for a variety of reasons did not want to testify against her and rekindle all those memories. I think that, Brown, that the government was successful in deporting Braunsteiner, wasn't it? To West Germany, yeah. Was that for lying on her uh, uh, visa application? Yeah, that, well, those are the grounds for deportation and stripped of her citizenship. She lied on her visa application about her affiliation with I am so sorry, I think that we have to finish it. And maybe if you want to ask uh, during the high school level, if you need something, then that would be very appropriate. I want to thank Dr. Lauer again for her marvelous presentation. Uh,
kind of a miserable story, isn't it? But as a, as a token of appreciation to Dr. Lauer, I had planned to give her my ticket in the lottery, which won. But she's so gracious that she accepted this instead. Just a sign of poor judgment. Box from Tiffany's is always a big hit. This looks gorgeous. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. This is beautiful. This is a uh, award, a plaque. The Burton C. Einstruck Holocaust Lecture Series, Wendy Lauer, October 26, um, 27, 2014, from the Ackerman Center. Thank you so much. I hope you come back again.